So we close our morning session with Dr. John, Jonathan Nolan, who's come up from Kingston Hospital. Dr. Nolan's a consultant gastroenterologist with, among other things, a specialist interest in inflammatory bowel disease. And he'll be talking about IBD flares and primary care. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, thanks very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's a, a real honor to join such a great faculty. So, um, yeah, IBD in primary care, IBD flare in primary care, it rhymes. I'm a consultant at Kingston Hospital down in the south, so nice to come up and visit you all here today. So as we heard from Charlie um, earlier on, the usual structure for patients um, uh, getting to secondary care to get the diagnosis of IBD, as, as Charlie mentioned, is to go, to go to you guys and then be referred into secondary care. And then historically, you, you know, people have often thought that all of their IBD care happens there, but it, it's not necessarily that way, is it? I mean, more patient-centered uh, approach on the right there, they come to you or secondary care. And more and more, we're trying to encourage patients to do self-management and use all the online resources out there, but we do need to signpost them to the correct areas, don't we? Um, but, uh, you know, these are some of the examples of what's out there. You've got a, an example of a, of a flare advice sheet from St. Mark's telling them to what to do with their mesalazine doses for ulcerative colitis, for example. We've heard from Charlie about some of the web portals that patients can use with their secondary care services to link in with them, see their hospital appointments. Some of them put their blood tests out uh, online for them uh, and uh, communicate with the IBD services through these portals. I've used a, a, a portal called Patient Knows Best. There's lots of them out there. We're still learning how to use them, and we probably need to do it with you guys. Um, I'm not quite sure we found the right way of using them yet, but there's definitely a lot of potential in these, these web portals for chronic diseases in general. But IBD in primary care, I mean, I guess it boils down to um, those with known IBD that will come to you because they're having a flare and uh, they've moved area and they can't get hold of their hospital team uh, or they trust you more or they know that they can get a quicker prescription off you guys than they can for us so i am aware that a lot of these patients still come to you rather than coming to their ibd helpline sometimes even though we we try to be there for them as, as best as, as we can and for ulcerative colitis there's a, a lot of that medication um, can be done very well by you guys, such as the mesalazines and the, the topical treatments, some of the newer steroid treatments uh, that are available now. Um, Crohn's disease, uh, you know, with budesonide out there, very safe drug for ileal disease. I think you guys can start to become more involved in that. And then we're seeing a lot more of this other inflammatory bowel disease now, microscopic colitis, still a bit rarer than full-blown IBD, but it seems to be increasing in its incidence. And you, you, you guys are probably seeing a lot of budesonide out there, and it's, it's good for you to become familiar with that as well. New IBD diagnosis, the border between IBS, that's your bread and butter. We've talked about referral pathways there. Really, we should, as hospital physicians, be providing you with a sort of four-week wait service when you're really suspecting IBD. We need to be seeing or reviewing them within four weeks, and that's mandated by NICE, so make sure you are getting that service from your hospital provider. The other aspects in which you're involved in IBD in primary care is, is maintaining or, or monitoring some of their uh, immunomodulator drugs, such as methotrexate, azathioprine, even the mesalazine. I've heard of some primary, pri I've, I've heard of some GPs asking for shared care protocol for that as well, because sometimes the monitoring of that kind of falls between the two of us, doesn't it? Um, always be aware and on the lookout for severe disease when it comes. I think probably um, don't miss a very severe flare-up of ulcerative colitis. Uh, the true love and wits criteria makes it relatively easy to identify it. It's six times a day, bloody diarrhea. That probably need that usually needs to go straight for proper steroids, prednisolone. But anything below that with colitis, you can use the mesalazines and the newer steroids, such as budesonide, MMX, cortimant, or, or uh, clipper, beclomethazone. 
Um, and then with Crohn's, it's a little bit more subjective, isn't it? I mean, pain, general well-being, but always be on the lookout for the complications of Crohn's, pain and fever, a very tender abdomen, vomiting, such as an obstructing stricture, or the perianal symptoms, you know, if they've got an abscess, they might actually need to be referred up to, for an emergency admission, particularly with acute severe colitis, uh, if they've got a CRP or tachycardia, fevers, six times a day with blood, they, they, they're going to need intravenous hydrocortisone. You need to phone up that medical registrar on the day. Um, this is Nana Schwartz. I'll talk a little bit about amina salicylate. She first discovered them um, for rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis patients and noticed they help a lot of their associated diarrhea. Um, probably the first example of a targeted therapy in the 1950s because it was actually the, the compound is being cleaved by colonic bacterial degradation, releasing the active moiety, which is actually the mesalazine, which does all the work of the anti-inflammatory effect. And it's working topically on the surface of the mucosa. Then it gets very rapidly broken down. So it's all about getting that molecule down to the colon. Uh, in colitis. Uh, some of the older ones, they were carrier molecules where they just tried to carry the mesalazine down for bacterial degradation, but nowadays we use the oral modified enteric coated release mesalazines, don't we? The pentasas and the uh, salafalx and all the newer ones, which is all about the enteric coating, keeping it intact until it can release that drug lower down the gut. Because if you just give the neat mesalazine, it just gets absorbed into the bloodstream. It doesn't even ever reach the colon and have that topical effect. And they remain first line in all of the standard uh, guidelines for IBD for mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. We know how effective this molecule is because if you've just got a little bit of proctitis, the response rate for a simple suppository of mesalazine is amazing. And we see this, and, and you guys see this, proctitis, Flexi-Sig, give them a suppository. It goes away within a matter of days. And this is a study from uh, Japan showing that the rectal bleeding is, is gone within three days, within about 80% of patients com compared to a placebo suppository. So it's all about getting this drug to the surface of the colon. These are the other topical rectal therapies. Some of them are available back there. And I think it's important to be, as doctors, aware of what we're actually prescribing, because these are quite complicated and unusual prescriptions, aren't they? Just, you know, draw your attention. The Pentasa uh, enema is quite a difficult bottle to squeeze. You can have a go at, at the back there. Whereas the, the Salafalc enema is a nice concertina uh, device there, which is a lot easier to collapse down for the patient. The foam tends to be better because it doesn't leak out, it's not a liquid. Suppositories, that Pentasa suppository, I've had patients describe that to me as a rock, feels a bit like a rock. So I think those bullet-shaped suppositories such as Salafalc or Octasa tend to be a lot easier for patients to put, to put in. One of the problems with the, these topical therapies is that they are absolutely brilliant. I mean, they're going to get this drug right to the area. The majority of ulcerative colitis is distal or left-sided. But, you know, as a maintenance thing, this is quite hard for patients to do. And there are studies out there showing that up to 68% of patients just can't keep this going every single day. So we do need the oral therapies, particularly for the maintenance, you know, when we've got them under control and we're then giving them their maintenance prescription afterwards, a lot of them will convert over to this. And that can be guided by the hospital, but we do need your involvement with this. Um, there's a lot of different products out there, and, they, and there are subtle differences between them all. So don't ever feel that we should be using one over another because they all have slightly different mechanisms of releasing the mesalazine. Pentasa is just gradually dissolving as the drug goes through the intestine. And so, it, you know, the delayed aspect to it tries to get some of it down to the colon. But the others are pH triggered because, as you can see in the diagram at the bottom there, the pH will gradually um, increase throughout the gut down towards the colon. So the others will trigger at pH 7 or 6. So salafalc will, will, will start releasing the drug when it hits terminal ileum. Uh, and azacol and uh, mesovant will do this when it's got into the colon, but some colons don't ever get to a pH of 7, and that's why you might hear patients describe, I'm actually seeing the azacol tablet come out whole sometimes, or sometimes they just see the casing, it's split up somewhere, but 
you wonder how far down it's actually opened up. One of the big problems with mesalazine is adherence with any chronic disease, young patients probably. Susie Kane did a lot of work of this back in 2006. She looked at the re prescriptions being replenished in, in colitic patients and found that only 40% of them were actually picking them up over one or two years and repeating their prescriptions properly. Risk factors for them not doing this was pill burden, multiple daily doses and the rectal therapy. So it's important to think about that, that in these young patients. And these are all the different formulations, ta numbers of tablets. You can see some of these tablets you're needing to take up to 16 times a day. That's a sulfasalazine at full dose. You know, they're, they're, they just don't do that. Um, and that's why some of these newer agents lower down on this, this um, uh, table there, you know, if you, there are some there you can just take one dose a day. Um, and that, I think, is important for patients. And, and again, these are available um, at the back there. Again, lots of tablets out there, and I don't think patients, young patients feel a bit strange taking multiple tablets a day when they're only 20 years old. And one of my personal favorites are pro probably the two in the top left there, the Salafalc 3 gram sachet is just one dose once a day, job done. And it's the same with Pentasa. There's a four gram sachet with Pentasa as well. But again, that's got a slightly different release mechanism. But some of those tablets are huge. I mean, those Pentasa tablets are pretty big. Um, yeah, I mean, but the difference, I mean, are there differences? I mean, look, the Cochrane database meta-analysis, and there's a meta-analysis saying, look, there's no major difference between all these different mesalazines. Um, but they're small studies, they're each got different inclusion, exclusion criteria, the way they're monitoring the disease. Some use endoscopy, some just go on different symptom scores. So I think it's difficult to be sure of that. There are some subtle differences when you look at individual uh, studies. Um, there's definitely differences in the pharmacokinetics. Uh, and there is some evidence that when you switch patients, they can have a positive response from going from one mesalazine product to another. This is just one example of a comparative study that grouped together four randomized studies comparing a pH-triggered mesalazine and this new salafalc granule sachet. And they actually found that you got statistically better response rates and even mucosal healing, which is quite a hard endpoint to, to, to reach, uh, in, in the distal types of colitis. They weren't given any rectal therapy so that we could really assess the oral um, approach in these patients. So it does make you think that these salafalc granules are designed to delay and slowly keep that mesalazine releasing all the way to the bottom end, whereas some of the pH uh, triggered ones may release it all in one go as soon, at a particular point. And this is how they do it. The mesalazine, these new micro pellets in that little sachet, they have uh, the micro pellets which increase the surface area that will come into communication with the mucosa, but they also have a matrix inside them which delays the release of the mesalazine once they've opened up. Mesavant does the same with this MMX technology. It creates a viscous gel which delays the release of the mesalazine. So this isn't a head-to-head -head trial and this isn't based on data, but Conceptually, this is probably the sorts of things that happens with all the different mesalazines. There are different release profiles for them. You can see the yellow line there is Pentasa. That's going to start releasing high up and all the way down, whereas the others are a bit more targeted. Possibly salafalc granules or mesovant is going to still be there when you get all the way down to the rectum. That's a scintigraphic study of the salafalc granules showing it's dispersing itself all the way through, even down at the rectum. There's a couple of examples of switching studies here where you're going from one mesalazine to another. You get 50 to 60% improvement for, for um, patients. And, and this is really a paper written by Taylor and Irving. Peter Irving, a, a big opinion lead in IBD, and it's in his list of options for trying to optimize mesalazine. Discuss it, you know, if you've got a patient that's already on mesalazine and they're flaring up again, is there anything you can do in primary care? discuss adherence, consider a switch, up the dose to the full whack now. We know that the doses can go a little bit higher and add back in the topical therapies. These are the costings. So the Salafalc granule sachet is actually the cheapest one out there. Um, so that's important to bear in mind. Monitoring in primary care, always do a baseline renal function before we start mesalazines orally. 
then at three months, then annually, because there's this very rare risk of um, tubular interstitial nephritis. We don't use it, mesalazines in Crohn's disease anymore. There's a meta-analysis now showing it doesn't really work in Crohn's disease. And what about other agents? I think you guys can become more familiar with this. There's budesonides out there now. They're perfectly safe, like mesalazines. So you can use these for mild to moderate disease. And with ulcerative colitis, you've got cortamint, nine milligrams, or clipper, which is a beclomethazone, eight-week course, or you've got budesonide for Crohn's, Entercort or budenifolk. Again, slightly different release mechanisms. In budenifolk, you've got the granules, again, the micropellets again, or tablets. Entercort's a bit like pentasa. It releases it slowly all the way through the, the bowel, but um, the small bowel. But budenifolk is pH triggered to the terminal ileum, so that fits well. But they've all got a very high first-pass metabolism so they get broken down. This steroid isn't going around the rest of the body of these patients, so they're very safe, very few steroid-related side effects. And there's evidence, and, pay, and, and I've got some meta-analysis there, of their efficacy in mild to moderate UC and mild to moderate ileal sequel Crohn's disease. Just a little bit about microscopic colitis there. You're seeing us use it more and more, very effective budesonide and we're starting to use it a little bit for maintenance now as well. So you might see us asking you to carry it on. You've probably seen this at three or six milligrams. Perfectly safe to do that up to a year. Not sure beyond that, but we're using it more and more on a longer term basis. And then of course you've got your systemic corticosteroids for severe flare ups. So in summary, I think in primary care, you are um, at the front line for optimizing these mesalazines and, and carrying them on for maintenance. You, topical treatments you can add in, the patients often come to you. And these new steroids, I think you can start to become more familiar and start using them because they're very safe. And same for Crohn's disease with those, uh, uh, always be on the lookout in Crohn's for those possible complications. So I think that's it for my talk. Thanks very much.